Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion on motoring news. This is episode 515 on Tuesday, the 28th of February, 2023. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Rich. And this week, we'll be talking about the end of the solar car, for the time being at least, a new way for companies to track the CO2 of travel. And we ask why a boot opens the way it does. That sounds intriguing. Oh, well, oh, don't, don't, don't get your hopes too high. Uh, Andrew's off being big and clever at the uk car of the year awards so he's got his little judge's hat on and his clipboard and stuff so so that's why poor rich has been dragged in this morning thanks that's okay uh so we'll start with follow-up then um and the first bit we have is is recharge buys uh british fault the failed in inverted commas battery startup that was going to build a factory in northumberland yeah I think regular listeners will be kind of sick of us talking about this right at the minute. Uh, but it looks like this could be the last time we're talking about British Vault in a sort of automotive, in an automotive context, uh, because um, Recharge Industries, who brought them, uh, they're looking to not use them immediately for vehicle battery manufacture, but actually for energy storage batteries first. And then they're saying, "Oh well, later on we might produce a battery for uh, uh, we might produce batteries for uh, low volume supercar type vehicles." So it seems to be a major change from what was originally promised, which was high volume um, high volume batteries for everyday you know everyday batteries for everyday cars for everyday people. And it seems to be, um, and it seems to be to be changing completely. So, sure, they're going to be making batteries, but not for the purposes that were originally planned, and not in support of the UK uh, motoring industry, which probably not awesome. I guess that's a sensible move for the time being. It kind of is, yes, but the whole all the money to go into this was to support volume car manufacturing in the UK and that's just out the window now. The other thing is that British Vault isn't high and dry yet. Um, It took Recharge quite a while to actually gather together the money and even then things aren't signed on the dotted line for another four or five days. So it could still... It could still not be a success. I know I sound like Andrew when Andrew's not here, but it it could still be a fantastic. Could still collapse. It could still fall through. Mm. So it, it's not completely cut and dry just yet. I mean, there'll be a link in the show notes to the BBC story, uh, obviously, um, and there'll also be a link to to a thread by Peter Campbell from the Financial Times. Um, with some of the background context and just some of the some of the responses from Financial Times readers and and some of the more detailed parts uh, there as well. So it's worth reading into if that kind of stuff interests you. If it's if it's something you want to to know more about. Uh, meanwhile, in new news, uh, Stellantis. Uh, Stellantis has posted record profits, uh, record being £14.8 billion uh, as its global EV sales rise by 41%. Um, This is all despite, um, this is all despite uh, car shipments falling below targets. Um, But I assume... I assume that a certain amount of this, because there are still, you know, semiconductor supply chain issues and stuff, a certain certain amount of this is because they can focus on the most uh, the most profit only building the most profitable vehicles mm. uh, from the chips that they have. Um, and and don't forget, it's only the second full year that Stellantis mm. has been, you know, around. Yeah. Yeah, it does make the sort of record bit seem a little bit lame, really, doesn't it? Um, but I, I guess if you, I don't know, if you collated together all the different all the different results from all the different parts over the years, I don't know if they were reported separately. Uh, that, may, that may be there. Uh, North America, by the way, is interesting in the, the, the uh, uh, 
and it actually shipped 1.9 million cars, 1.9 million vehicles, which was up 2%, but there was a 23% rise in net revenue. Um, and that's down to Jeep models and the Chrysler Pacifica minivan, uh, which we don't have the compass. Do we get the compass in the UK? It's hard, uh, to, it's hard to remember. I think so. I'm not 100% sure. It's kind of, the, the Jeep brand has been kind of forgotten in the UK, really, hasn't it? Um, yeah, but the others were the, the Grand Wagoneer as well, which I don't think is sold in the UK. Uh, I don't think it's sold out. So it's one of it's a big one, so it doesn't really make sense to try it in, in Europe. No, I'm sure the Avenger um, might change things though when that comes here. I know. I've seen nothing but nice things said about that, and it also looks great. And there's you know European Car of the Year uh, to the Jeep Avenger, so that should that should be interesting to see. I, I do really do really like the look of that. Mm, mm. Um, Moving on to a similar Stellantis uh, theme, uh, Citroën CEO Vincent Corby steps down um, and Thierry Coscas, in my in my best Duolingo French, is appointed uh, to CEO, which I think has come as a bit of a surprise. It, it does, because he wasn't... Um... He wasn't appointed very long ago, was he? No, and I, uh, I don't th- think the impression is that, that he, he's done some good things with the brand too while while he's been there. Mm-hmm. So, um, but he he will no longer be boss from from the first of March, mm-hmm. um, and is according to this Motor One article, is stepping away to pursue personal projects outside of the company. Whatever that means, which is a bit. That's a bit generic, isn't it? So we'll, we'll see. I mean, we could be reading things into it, this, which which shouldn't be read into. It might well be that he's just decided to, I don't know, take up lavender farming in Provence or something. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, it just seems quite a strange swap at the top when Citroen seems to be doing quite well at the minute. Mm, an interesting th- thing is that, that Koskas, who is uh, replacing him, is currently the chief sales and marketing officer for Stellantis as a whole, and he will continue doing that role while also heading up Citroen. I'm sure that that'll be temporary, though. Maybe he's he's just caretaking. Do you think? Mm, possibly that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. We'll, we'll we'll see what happens. This one we'll keep an eye on it, and uh, and obviously we'll 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 report on it when anything seems to happen. Indeed. Next up, um, next up is the the. It's I don't know. No, normally, normally this sort of comes at the end of new new car news is old old car losses, um, but in this case, uh, the German company Sono, um, who unveiled a little while ago, they unveiled the Sono Sion, or it must be Sion, mm-hmm. yeah, not Sion, um, and. We reported on it, and lots of people said, you know, this might actually pretty much work. Uh, it was a small hatchback, or a medium-sized hatchback, uh, colored in solar panels. The idea being that it could complement standard EV system, add around 80 miles of range, um, and was going to cost about £22,000. Uh, they have just axed the Sion City car. They've just axed that, that whole project. Uh they are uh they just can't they're saying they just can't secure funding to push forward with development of the project and as a result um as a result they're going to focus purely on solar panels instead uh, just on making solar panels rather than actually a product using those solar panels uh Sonos is still working with mitsubishi europe scania man trucks which scania and man trucks of course both being part of volkswagen group um and uh, uh, on ways to sort of augment them uh, and their electric power plants with uh, with solar panels, but they it looks like they're not going to be building their own product. Mm, there's, there's, it's a bit of a shame. Yes, there's a lot of interesting things going on in that space at the moment. There's um, uh, Lightyear, which is a a Dutch company which also makes, well, was making solar cars in effect, for want of a better term. Um, and had the light year zero um, 
this article says that they've recently declared bankruptcy, which I think is true. But I've also read that they are focusing um, development on the Lightyear 2, which I think is a smaller vehicle. Right. Um, but whether that... I mean, re- I mean... I mean, it would have to be really to, for the solar panels to make a a significant difference, wouldn't they? Mm, but whether that will see the light of day, pun not intended, I don't know. Yeah, shame. Yeah, it's tricky one. And three hundred and uh, stopping the the Sion program means that they'll that Sun will be making about three hundred employees redundant as well. So, um, so yeah, that that's never good news. Never good news. No, no. Moving on um, to a story by, well, friend of the show and co-host and fellow UK Car of the Year judge, uh, Alex Grant. No, he's he's, he's ticking all his <laughs> wait all his hats. <laughs> so what? What? What a puke! He's ticking all the boxes. <laughs> um, an autocar story that that the Miles Consulting has developed a smartphone app, which enables uh, corporate businesses to track the cost and carbon impact of business journeys now this also includes public transport walking and cycling um, with Mm. the aim of steering employees towards the cheapest and the most sustainable options of transport available yeah i I like i like the look of this by the way i'm such a i know what a weirdo i actually like the look of this i'm going to suggest this we've got a, a sort of green initiative at work uh, and i'm actually going to i think once we're done i'm, I'm going to i'm going to recommend this i'll pass this article on to the, the lady who's running that um because this kind of stuff really interests me mm. yeah yeah um so yeah um so this splits it all by by cost by time uh, it's got benchmarks it, it sort of adds up you know your your the the CO two use for business for private for commuting and stuff. Um, I guess you've got to track it as you go along. It's like a sort of calorie counting thing. Um, but I think it's um, I think it's quite a cool idea. Yeah this this states that the phase one of the app will start by the end of March, which uses sensors in the phone to detect when people are moving. Um, mm. And it enables them to classify their journeys by by mode, which I guess a lot of that will depend on on the data they they input. Um, but it also calculates the cost CO two is burned and the time it took to complete mm. those journeys, um, and benchmarks it against fellow users too. Yes, yeah. So that's I, I, I don't know. It's it's. It's one of these things which I think if you use it properly, it's probably really good. But if you don't use it properly and you don't bother putting in all the, the data correctly, then what's the point? Mm. I mean, I, I, I love the idea of it and I am I tend to be an absolute stickler for these things anyway. I mean, I, 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 I track the mileage of my car. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I, I track all these, these costs and miles and uh, economy and all sorts of stuff for all my cars because because I need to get a life, quite frankly. Well, no, I'm the same. Um, and this, I'm the same. Well, I'm saying nothing about you. I'm just talking about me. Um, but <laughs> so, but so this kind of thing does does interest me, especially. I mean, not so much these days. I mean, I mostly work from home. I, I go to the office once a week. I don't really do many business miles uh, now. Uh, by whichever mode whereas in the olden days when i was in you know i'd be in three or four countries a week um this would actually have been super interesting mm. yeah i mean uh, this is quite good in the fact that that these calculators include fixed costs such as the benefit mm. kind tax insurance and monthly lease for any default vehicles that are registered uh what's up next oh yes uh, we were talking before about um about uh british vault pivoting to energy storage and and um that curiously i'm, I'm sure it's it's not it's uh, it's completely coincidental but that comes uh a f- only a few days after national highways uh, announcing an eight million pound boost to ev charging at motorway services and national highways are going to try and supply giant battery packs inside shipping containers to improve ev charging at motorway services across Hooray. the uk uh, more 
Yay, exactly. Well, more and more folk are buying electric cars, as, as well, you know well, no, Rich? Uh, buying electric cars, and the trouble is that sometimes when people are going on longer journeys, there just isn't necessarily the infrastructure for all of the world to charge at all of the same places, trying to do it all at the same-ish time. Uh, and that's caused problems at, at service stations and stuff. I mean, it's great that people are using it, you know, the infrastructure that is being put in place is being used, and that's fantastic. Mm. Um, I just, um, but there does need to be a bit more of it. And this is a, what do you reckon, a sticky plaster? Stop gap? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the two million, no, two megawatt hours of power, which it says here is enough power to, mm -hmm. to provide more than two million EV motoring each year. This is a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is. I, I see there's a list of where they're going to start the rollout, and it makes a lot of sense, really. Mm. Uh, Beaconsfield on the M40. Uh, Corley on the M6 northbound. Uh, Clackett Lane on the M5, eastbound and westbound. I can never picture where Clackett Lane is because it's a part of the M25. I don't south. Really travel on. Mm. It, it, it's the one at the mm, south, yeah, yeah. isn't it? It's not the new one. It's the other mm. one, yeah. Uh, Maidstone on the M20, which is a horrible service station. Mm. Uh, Taunton on the M5 northbound and T-Bay on the M6 northbound. One of the things I notice about this is the ones where I know where they are, they're all at the top of a hill. Okay. <laughs> hmm. um, which kind of makes sense because that's just when the, the thing's going, no, 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 I need a bit more juice. Um, when I first read this... But yes. Um, when I first read this list the other day, I... I immediately thought these aren't places that don't have anything at all, are they? They're just bolstering stuff. They must be the busiest, yes. you know, junctions, I guess, or stations. They kind of are, and if 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 you look at where they are, then that is kind of you know, they're the people going on holiday ones, aren't they? Mm. Mm. Uh, really, uh, or mostly. Um, they're they're sort of where you get those 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 build ups really um and so they're hoping to have each site hoping to have at least six extra chargers uh provided by these by these uh container batteries um yeah in twin uh by the end of twenty twenty three it says so we'll we'll again keep an eye out on the rollout there um they do point out that drivers today never more than 25 miles from a rapid charge point anywhere on England's motorways and major railroads. Uh, but this news marks another innovative step to making sure that rapid charging is accessible and reliable. I can tell you that sometimes if if, you, if your car is angry turtling at you because stuff you've not been able to charge, 25 miles seems like a very long time. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. I really had a problem with, well... Uh, public networks, but then I don't use it a huge amount, so that could be why. No, but thankfully, for those who do, there is a new 56 million pound fund to help councils expand the EV charging networks. Um, this move in electric story says that a total of 2,400 EV charge points will be installed across 19 local authority areas in England. Only England, though, it looks like, as part of government plans to ramp up the UK charging network. Um, and this comes as part of the Department for Transport Local Electric Vehicle Infrastructure uh, funding expansion okay. and as part of the on-street so, on residential charge point scheme initiatives. Yeah, so the 16 area local authorities that have... Uh, that have managed to secure the funding uh, for these charge points. And they are Buckinghamshire, Cumbria, Hacknett, wherever that may be, Harborough, Hounslow, Lancashire, Norfolk, Oxfordshire, Rotherham, Sunderland, Waltham Forest, West Midlands, West Sussex, West Yorkshire, and York. It's a very needed pocket there. Certainly Norfolk is one, or used to be one anyway. I, th I, I don't think it's as bad as it was, but I, I remember when we did um, Charging Around Britain and we were trying to, then we were literally, it was Dartford Tunnel, Kings Lynn, and then I, I can't remember where it was after that, it was somewhere, no, it was Dartford Tunnel, ra hidden around the back of some tiny filling station in the rain, 
where I had to spend five minutes on the phone to get it to act. <laughs> it was it was it was old school. It was old school Electric Highway, whatever the company's name that I've now forgotten. Dale. Mm. Yeah, and then I can't remember where it was next. Somewhere, somewhere just north of north of Norfolk. Um, so, so yeah, it used to be it used to be awful. That's why we didn't go around the around the edge. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But it was it was. I mean, the trouble was you had Norfolk on one side and Wales on the other side that were completely devoid of rapid charges at the time. So this is this is good news. Mm. Yes, good news. Very very good news. Um, at the same time, though, uh, there's a Guardian article about. Um, about greenwashing firms. Uh, so this is where this is where companies that make that make claims which are hard to substantiate uh, about about um, about. Uh, let me let me read. It, let me. I, I'm making a complete mess of rephrasing this. So. From the article itself, legislation could see companies find millions of pounds for making unproven environmental assertions to sell their products. There we go. That's far more succinct than anything I was going to say just there. <laughs> um, the example it gives in the story is is, is Hyundai um, saying that the Nexo, uh, of course, hydrogen-powered Nexo, um, uh, and saying that it purifies the air as it goes. And... Um, and that the vehicle could be driven without leaving any pollution sounded too good to be true, uh, and it turned out that actually that 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 didn't count because, of course, tires leave tiny shreds of stuff. Now it was a hydrogen car. We all know what some people are like about hydrogen, um, uh, where it is seen as the the evil upon all evils compared to say a car with a a very large uh, battery. Um, uh so it may well have been picked out specifically but then the whole thing is it's not just automotive manufacturer it's not just car manufacturers or automotive um it's all about everything um uh, be it soft drinks cleaning fluids all sorts of stuff uh there are over exacerbated claims about in, about how good things can be for the environment um so and and it quotes Purzel from Unilever, uh, Georgia, Asda, Asos, Boohoo, etc. So it's not just cars, uh, but this is going to, they are going to generally crack down on these things. But I guess uh, automotive manufacturers do have to be awfully careful uh, on, on these things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the EU is going to make a new law in the next few weeks that will give fines for companies who make these, these unsubstantiated um, claims. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt we will follow along just afterwards with our own special version. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Nah, yes, we're not mentioning the B word. No. Well, what, well, one B word we are going to mention is Bentley. Yes, it's, it's Bentley, um, who is. It's W12 engine will bow out in 2024 with the arrival of the battle. I'm told it's the Batur. Uh, Andrew's actually seen it in, in oh, real he? life and had a, a look and a poke at it. Yeah, yeah, because he was at the ben, ben, Bentley factory not so long ago and, and says it is particularly good looking. Oh. That's Mr. Oh, these cars really don't interest me. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that all production of the twin turbocharged engine will stop in April 2024. And, and Bentley will focus its efforts on, on V8 and V6 hybrids instead. Um, converting its production line for W12 to an expanded area for these powertrains. Mm. That engine has been around for quite a while. It was so it was introduced in the A8 in 2001. So it's had a fairly good. That's going to have been what 23 years or so of of, of that W12. Engine. Yeah, and this auto car story states that 100,000 examples of the engine have been built. So so yeah. The sixty thousand dollar question is how many are still running now? Mm. I mean, it's not as bad as the W eight, I suppose. No, but no, no. But yes, seven hundred thirty nine horsepower. That's a lot of power. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, and seven hundred thirty one seven pound feet of torque. 
Wow. Mm. And in- yeah, that's so. Whenever we feel that, whenever we feel the planet start to spin the other way, it's it's uh, it's when Autocar are doing a are doing a full bore acceleration test on one of these. I think. Yes, interesting. The 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 eighteen matures that were be made have already been well have already sold out. Um, yeah, that doesn't. Surprise. But of course, you can still order speed variants of the Continental GT and the Flying Spur Mulliner versions. That can still have the engine, the W two R engine. Mm-hmm. I shall just run out and use my pocket change to buy one of those. <laughs> yeah, they're nice things, though. They're nice, nice things. Yes, indeed. And yes, that takes us to Guilt Minute, the quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support to keep the lights on and the hosting running. If you feel the motoring podcast worth a small consideration every month, then you can become a patron. Different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you, including being able to watch the show recorded live. We also have a small collection of merchandise in our spring store, from stickers to mugs and t-shirts. If you don't have any spare cash, and we completely understand, then you can help us by following for free from a podcast player to receive every show as they're released, and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supplier lets you. If you've done all that, and some of you do, so thank you very, very much, then the last thing you can do is to recommend us to your friends or colleagues. So what's the first bit of new car news, Alan? So uh, first bit of new new car news is the Vauxhall Corsa. Yes, Britain's second most registered new vehicle in 2022. Not selling, um, registered. Registered, yes, 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 yes. That's, we are nothing if not pedantic. Uh, the Yeah, it's going to receive a, it says a major midlife refresh this year. It feels to me like it's barely just been launched, but, mm. you know, I think I'm getting old. Well, I know I'm getting old. Uh, so, but it, it seems it is already pretty much time for the facelift. Uh, as part of that, it is going to get the visor grill uh, that we already see on the Astra and the Mocha. That's the sort of slab of shiny black plastic across the front, which is, I think, it's pretty good looking. I like mm, it. Yes, yes, yeah. We saw a Mocha yesterday that was, I think, had red knees mm. having on the roof and things, and it does still look very, very good. Yeah, it is. Whenever you consider it to the Luke, that was the the the, the previous generation Mocha and Mocha X or whatever it was, mm. um, which was a, 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 a frankly, it was a horrible thing. And we discussed before there were no more bad cars, and one of the reasons for that is that the previous generation Mocha ended. <laughs> um, and that said, people who bought them love them. Uh, so what do we know, really? Uh, but yeah, I think it's going to adopt uh, some line LED headlamps. It's going to have a new that new front front family look um and uh and yeah it seems to be working i mean i've said for a while that the biggest challenge Vauxhall has these days is is that it keeps using the same names so everybody has a mental image of what a course it is mm. and and that impacts on the new models mm. which are you know the same as the old model but only in name um yes so, so I, I do think that that's that, that, that that's a shame the Vauxhall. But this uh, the current course I've not driven one, but they do look, they do look good. Yeah, yeah, uh, and they do seem very popular. Yeah, no, that it, it does drive. Very and go, going on these this fire photos in this autocar article, they don't seem to, to be doing many changes to the rest of the car. It's mainly the front end, but um, it's likely to be premiered. I think in the first few months of this year. So already two months through. Um, going on sale towards the second half. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 pretty imminent then. I mean, they're, they're saying that the price, uh, they being Autocar, by the way, are saying that the price is likely to increase from £18,015 starting point, but to stay below 20000 Um And reminding us that the electric variant starts from £31,000, which seems like an awful lot of money for a Corsa, but Mm. obviously you're paying that on the monthly. Uh, We'll see what happens. Uh, They are looking to introduce a GSE, a hot electric version. I mean, uh, obviously not hot because the battery is overheated or anything, Um, but a more performance-oriented electric version. Uh, And they're saying that that is likely to hit the 35000 mark. Um, So we shall see what happens uh, again but um but yeah that sort of vxr style sporty electric city 
car, small hatch. Sounds pretty, actually, to me, that sounds pretty appealing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and if it looks as good as the as the render does there, it'll be good, I think. Yeah, I think mm. so, too. Yay. Staying with um, Stellantis. Um, they, they, they do seem to have all the news this week. <laughs> yes. Well, what, there's one story that's not. Um, well, in the new car station, anyway. Um, Peugeot has unveiled its updated 508 PSE, which is the performance plug-in hybrid version. Um, and it has a, a striking new face. I think you'll agree it's quite striking. Um, it, it is. It's, yes, it's, it's got many lines on it. Yeah, the front end actually reminds me of, of as is in this EVA article, the, the Le Mans hypercar they've got um, mm. with the, the claw-like lights at the front and things like that. Yeah. I'm sure that's not an accident. No. No. Mm -hmm. um, that appears to be the biggest change, though. Yeah. It looks like it's the same. It's the same, pretty much the same uh, powertrain as before. So it's got the turbocharged 1.6 four-cylinder petrol engine uh, and then two electric motors. Um, so actually, in, in total, it's putting out 355 brake horsepower with a 381 pound feet of torque. Uh, and it looks, it looks good. I mean, the previous jet, the pre facelift looked good as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 got excellent write ups from everyone saying this is a fantastic car. It's quite expensive. Um, it should be a bargain used. We, we just need some masochists to buy them new, really. Mm. Mm. And when you actually think about it, three hundred and three hundred and fifty five percent horsepower. I think it it's, was, yeah. I've, I've now lost it. It's a lot for a Peugeot. Which I know is the same as before, but I hadn't really thought about it before. Well, it's it's that, and it's the fact that obviously it's all-wheel drive, so it can put that power down. It's not just going to sort of talk steer off to the one side of the road. It's, yeah, it is it is it is quite a lot, but it's it should be a, a fantastic way of covering ground, that car. Yeah, yeah. The regular models will also get the visual updates, but this mm -hmm. the PSE version will cost upwards of fifty five thousand pounds when it goes on sale later this year. Yeah, yeah. All, all three of them that they'll sell, but I'm so glad that they're selling it anyhow. Yes. Um. Meanwhile, in sort of bowing out news uh the audi tt final edition has been really revealed for the uk market i think this is this is essentially um volkswagen's mainstream brands leaving any form of sports car market isn't it mm. uh, there's no sirocco anymore no uh this is the end of the tt as we know it um but there's going to be a final edition trim unique to the uk market it'll be available in both coupe and roadster uh, and should reach customers in April. It'll be cost from about 42,000, just a smidge under 42,000 pounds for the TT and uh, about 55,000 pounds for the TTS. Um, they'll basically have all the gear. Um, the black package, uh, Quattro, DSG. Uh, they'll be available in Tango Red, Glacier White and Kronos Grey. Um, and yes, uh, extended leather packages, all sorts of things like that will all be standard. It seems a shame. I mean, the TT has been around for quite a while. I mean, it was unveiled when I was at, when I was at university, it appeared on every single flipping mood board that every product <laughs> design engineering student seemed to create ever to the stage where it actually for a long time, it put me off the Audi TT, particularly the Mark one, um, just because of its ubiquity within the, the, the sort of circles i was in at the time um but since then I've, I've really kind of grown to appreciate it much more uh, i think yeah i mean those first ones were what, 95 97 or something and um must well, have been about the content yeah, was certainly mm, yeah and everywhere you look now the first gen ones even though they were not always the most exciting car to actually drive were you know i've been held as modern classics i think predominantly because of the way they look and and i always loved the kind of baseball mitt kind of interior. 
Yes, uh, for the on the convertibles. Yeah, yeah. I, I think is it. Um, oh, what's the name? Chap designed uh, art design trainers. Is it Michael Ditulo? I think he's got one, um, which is grey with the and it's got the sort of baseball coloured seats inside as well, a convertible with that baseball stick with that exposed stitching down mm-hmm. the outside. The absolute sort of classic, um, you know, as they showed it at the motor show kind of spec. Um, and it does. It looks fantastic now. Mm. As as I say, I was so meh to it at the time, just because I was I was so bored of it appearing as a design classic uh, back then. But now, now that people have mostly shut up about it, I, I much prefer it. It's just kind of weird. It's typical me. <laughs> um, but no, even even the current sort of third gen, um, it does. It's a good looking car. I mm. just. It it seems a shame. I I can't remember what's replacing it in the in the factory. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's something uh, electric and squared off. Um, like probably an SUV, but uh, or a coupe yeah, SUV, probably. maybe. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I... Prob- the answer is the answer is probably. Hmm. I was quite amused actually. I I recently I. I um, so over here, there's a there's a very large uh, Volkswagen, uh, which breaks the naming convention. It's the only Volkswagen SUV that doesn't start with a T, uh, and it's the Atlas. Mm-hmm. And they they do, and it's kind of Audi Q8 size, so it's the Volkswagen equivalent of the Audi Q8, and they do a coupe version, and it was listed a couple of weeks ago as the vehicle. No, the vehicle that U.S. car buyers were least likely to buy again. Oh, really? And I, I don't. I didn't. I never quite got to the bottom of why okay. that was, but it just seemed. It was quite unusual because I'd I'd questioned it on Twitter a few weeks before, saying, Is, "Has anybody ever seen one of these that isn't that that's well driven?" Let's let me rephrase what I said on Twitter. That's that's well driven. And uh, and someone said, "Well, I know one, but that's only because I know the driver, and he's a friend of mine." Um, uh, but but generally, they're, they're, they're driven pretty appallingly. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a kind of expectation gap there. Anyway, that's us way off topic, um, and we should keep on and talk about the next. Yes, well, talking about automotive next design as we were, um, the chief of design for Hyundai and Genesis, Sang Yub Lee, has been named. World Car Person of the Year 2023. Hmm. It's the second. Well deserved, I think. Yeah, I mean the 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 style of the cars they're putting out now is way way different <laughs> from before, you know, even five years ago. Yes. Oh yeah. Goodness, yes. Sorry, I interrupted you. I think you were probably about to tell us who the five other, the four other finalists were. The other finalists were were Wang Trang Fu, Chairman and President of BYD. Dr. Stella Clark, who works at BMW as a research engineer. Um, Peter Rod- Rawlinson, CEO and CTO of Lucid Motors. And Naoyuki Sakamoto, chief engineer uh, for GR, Corolla and Gazoo Racing uh, at Toyota. Um, and these, these awards are given by the World Car Awards Committee. And it's the second time in a row, I think, that someone from Hyundai Motor Group has won the prize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is which is pretty impressive itself. My apologies, by the way. I have when I was going through assigning these, I I wasn't intentionally assigning all the hard to pronounce names <laughs> to to Rich. It's just the way it's fallen. I'm so sorry. That's why right. I'm sure I butchered one or two of them, but. We 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 invite people on and then give them all the tongue twisters. <laughs> Interestingly, the uh, Sangup Lee worked alongside Luke Luka Donka Volker, who was last year's winner um, mm-hmm. at uh, Volkswagen, where they designed the Bentley Continental GT and Flying Spur, and also the Bentayga. Yeah, so there's quite a quite quite a collection of of. I was going to say quite a collection of good-looking cars and the Bentayga uh, between them. So yeah, no, it's, it's 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 all good. So ni- nice to see these you know, good design getting getting uh, 
uh, getting getting celebrated and people recognized as well all, all five people in the list there yeah so that takes us to the start of this week's uh, points of interest and we kick off uh, with the lunchtime read uh, and this week's lunchtime read is, if he scrolls all the way back to the top of the article, uh, Spy Shots, the golden age of tip-offs, car chases, and inside jobs. Um, it's published on Haggerty by Tom Barnard. Um, and it should, in theory, according to Haggerty, take you about 11 minutes to read. And it is all about the golden ages of automotive spy photography. Uh, talking about uh, just talking about people trying to get those snaps like uh, Hans Lemon who's a, a name that we've seen lots and lots of places mm -hmm. um, Brenda Priddy uh, and others and just what they went through and what they were doing to try and get those get those snaps of 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 cars before they'd been unveiled it's it's a cracker it's it's well worth 11 minutes of your lunch yeah, well, I've just saved it to my pocket list so uh... yeah there are yeah, it's it. No, when we were growing up, it was all you know. You, you used to see them in all the magazines, weekly and monthlies. You small jag, yeah. yeah, with various bits of cladding on and boxes and tape and all sorts. Yep, it's a really excellent article. Well worth a read, folks. Cool. Well, list of the week this week is from yep. Motor Research, and it's twenty nine car brands we'd like to bring back now. I've not seen this at all, so I don't know. But, and I'm only part way. I was say, going through, are there any that you would? Uh, um, it's a tough one, this. I mean, there's all the sort of, it, the ones that you would expect, really, in there. Um, uh, but I think... Oh. I did question Alpine, but it does say in there, actually, that, that, that it is already back, so... We'll let that one go. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, I know. Um, I know. Daff. Let's ha let's. Do oh, okay. Okay. I. You know, there is a time and a place. It's it's Daff's love of CVTs and all that kind of thing could quite easily be, be translated into a a small a small Dutch EV. I think. And my mum had one when I was little. Oh, okay. I I would quite like. I think. Because I like them both, I I think Auto Yankee. Because I always yes, that was up like the A one A one twelve, and of course mm -hmm. they they did the first Y ten, um, and also Innocenti who did the I forget the name of it now, the car that was based on the Mini. Actually, it was the Mini, wasn't it? I think it was. It was the Mini. Yes, they built the Mini under license in Italy. Um, as well as as well as a, a couple of other cars as well, but yeah, those are yeah, those are good choices. Those were on the ones that I was I was picking, I was trying to pick from there. So, see, I always, I've always liked the the Auto Bianchi because they did an Abarth version as well of the A one twelve. Yes, exactly. And there was there was there was a sort of one of these arcade racing games which you could sort of drive around Monaco and other places in tiny little hot hatches, like Renault Five Gordini's uh, Al, uh, Gordini's and stuff. Actually, Renault Five Alpine, I think, it was, because it was the you know the European branding, uh, and and others, and I always chose the Otto Bianchi um, a bath oh. because weird. <laughs> Nobody else ever knew what it was, and I thought it was cool. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, it was the the Italian the Italian Mini. Yeah. Last but not least, this week, uh, then we have uh, we have the and finally uh, and finally this week, um, there's an article from the Autopian, uh, and it's pointing out that there is a, a strange advert appearing at the bottom of of, of some web pages, uh, showing an Ionic a Hyundai Ionic Five, but the rear hatch uh, opens up onto the onto the roof as opposed to opening in the traditional hingy up kind of mouth fashion that works really well as an audio description didn't it <laughs> you know what i mean instead of opening traditionally it kind of slid up the way um so it sat on on top of the roof uh which has you know space saving benefits and access benefits and all sorts of stuff like that but it seems that this this picture is being used in 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 a not traditional hyundai advert um in fact it's not even necessarily by hyundai 
uh, but it is being used by people. And so they went and they took a little bit of a look, they being Jason Toczynski, went and took a little bit of a look, and it finds out that Hyundai did actually patent it. Hmm. It does actually exist as a patent. It's just that obviously at some point they decided not to incorporate the sliding tailgate. Maybe it was too complicated. Maybe it was um, too costly. Uh, but there is actually a patent for that taken out by Hyundai and Kia. But what, uh, I guess the question is then, what, where does that photo come from? Or, 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 or who leaked the photo, if it is real? I, d I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's just a bit, it's a bit strange. It's as if it was an early concept idea. But it's very dangerous to me. But the trouble with the, yeah, but the trouble with the Ionic 5 is it's very hard to find a picture which is a concept because it looks just like a concept anyway. Yeah. But if you look at the picture, it doesn't really look photoshopped. No. It does look like there are tracks inside the boot and the way it's sitting. Um, if it has been added on afterwards, it's it's very well done. But yeah, where did the picture come from is a, is another question. Mm. It's another question entirely, which isn't really, um, isn't really answered in the article. So it would be interesting to know where that comes from. Yeah. Yep. But anyway, that I think is it for the week. I don't think there's anything in parish notes. Not this week. Not as different from any any other time. Um, so that just leaves it for me to round out. Um, don't forget that between now and next week, you can give us any feedback. Share your thoughts with the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook and on the contact page at motoringpodcast.com, the hub of all our activities. Uh, remember, you can support us financially via Patreon, and please leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing. Rich, thanks very much for taking time out of your day to join me today in Andrew's absence. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, what's, the best, what's the best way to get in touch with you if people want to know more about you? Uh, probably on Twitter, uh, where... They can follow me at, at richgooding.com. Um, if you want to get in touch with Andrew, despite the fact that he's being a terrible slacker this week, uh, then you can, of course, search for Crack Windscreen on Twitter and on Mastodon as well. Uh, to get in touch with me, it's best to use Twitter, where I'm at AJP Bradley. Again, same username on Mastodon. Uh, we'll be back very soon. But until then, I've been Alan Bradley. And I've not been Andrew Clues. <laughs> and safe motoring. <laughs>